morning. I think we typically like to simplify uh, biblical concepts as much as we can and make them easy to understand. And that's, oh, that's, probably, um, that's probably a good thing in many times that we don't want to overcomplicate things, but maybe sometimes we oversimplify things a little bit. Um, you can look at the two covenants. Uh, often when we think of two covenants, we think of the old law or the law of Moses, the covenant that God had with the people of Israel. And then uh, we think about the new covenant in Christ's blood. And many people comment that God seems very different in the Old Covenant or in the Old Testament as compared to the New. And maybe sometimes we oversimplify that a little bit. We might say, well, the God of the Old Testament, he was uh, very wrathful and violent, but the God of the New Testament is just uh, overflowing with love and mercy and just wants everyone to be happy. Or we might say the God of the Old Testament, he had all these commands of how he wanted to control the way people lived. But in the New Testament, he doesn't really care what we do as long as we have faith and love. Um, and the truth is it's the same God in the Old and the New Covenant, and there's a lot of, of continuity between the two uh, testaments of Scripture. And the more I read, the more I notice that. The more I find things in the New Testament that sound like Old Testament, or the more I find things in the Old Testament that sound a lot like the New Testament. Uh, I would suggest that if we want to really uh, focus on what are some big and important differences between the two uh, testaments that you read the book of Hebrews because the book of Hebrews does a, a very thorough job, gives a very thorough treatment to discussing what's different uh, under the law of Moses versus um, the new covenant inaugurated by Jesus' blood at his death. Well, what about the God behind these two covenants? Did he change suddenly to have a totally different nature? I'd like to just talk about a few sort of misconceptions that we might have or oversimplifications that we might make about that. One thing we might say is that under the old covenant, they were under law, which means that God gave them a lot of rules to follow. But under the new covenant, we're under grace, which means there are no rules that we have to live by anymore. Um, that God used to be this king that made decrees that told people how they had to live, but now he's He's more of like, uh, you know, a, a benevolent grandfather who spoils us but doesn't ever tell us no. You might hear someone say, I think Jesus would just want people to be happy or to do whatever makes them happy. And the uh, scripture certainly says that we are under law, not under grace. For instance, in Romans 6, 14, you are not under law, but under grace. Um, I have had people just basically tell me it, what you do with your life now is not really a big deal all that matters is that you have faith I remember uh, in middle school there was a, a kid who told me my youth minister said that I shouldn't feel bad about it when I sin because Jesus has, has washed it away and maybe we get where he was coming from but maybe sometimes we take that a step too far and become flippant about how we live now because after all we have we have grace to cover everything uh, and also maybe we sometimes wrongfully assume that, well, God had no grace towards people in the Old Testament when they made mistakes, when that wouldn't be true either. But you notice in the context of Romans 6, 6.14 comes after 6.1 and 2, which says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Well, how can the scriptures even talk meaningfully about sin if sin doesn't have any definition anymore, if there's no action that we can point to and say, God tells us not to do that, well then, how would we even know if we were continuing in sin or not? James 4.17 says, Therefore, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Yes, we live under a new covenant of Jesus' blood in which there is grace um, to cover our imperfections, but that doesn't mean there's not a right thing to do. And that... We should do it, and that if we disregard that right thing, that it isn't a sin. I think Jesus lays this out very clearly in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. He said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. <clears throat> 
Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And we know in this Sermon on the Mount that he's introducing here that he goes on to talk about some of the commandments in the old law and to show how he wants to fulfill those commandments and bring them to their fullness and show us the spirit behind the law as well as the law itself. And I think that's probably what he's talking about when he says, whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to talk about commandments, um, like do not murder, do not commit adultery, and then the uh, additional teaching that he brings along with those commandments that still apply to us today. Um, if you insisted on having a list, this is certainly not a comprehensive list, but I've included some scriptural references down at the bottom, and these are some sins that are listed in these verses. Uh, and these aren't just things that the Bible says do not do, but all of these are ones where um, scripture actually warns us that we won't be able to enter the kingdom of heaven if we make a practice of these. Um, and so it's not as if, well, there's just no, there's no rules anymore about what we can and cannot do. There are a lot of specific things that are mentioned that we are, that we are specifically warned against. John 13, 34, and 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Now, some might point to that and say, See, the, the only commandment we have now is that we just have to love. Um, and if we love, then we don't have to worry about any specific rules about what we should or should not do. Maybe in a sense that's right, because Jesus said all the law and the prophets hung on love for God and loving our fellow man as ourself. But I think we would need to stop and think for a minute about what it means to love one another. Um, doesn't that mean to do things in a certain way and not in another way? It may be simpler to say, we just need to love each other, but it doesn't make the situation any easier. It doesn't mean, oh, now we can do whatever we want. We just have to love one another because acting in love means acting in a specific way. So we could summarize it. We could summarize it this way. The God of the Mosaic Covenant made the rules, and the God of the Covenant of Christ still makes the rules today. And we are not justified based on our ability to keep all of the rules perfectly. We're not going to be kept out of heaven unless, um, unless we can do everything with no errors whatsoever for our entire lives. And we don't think that we can justify ourselves to God. But there are rules to live by. There are principles that can't be ignored, that you can't just disregard what God says. So another misconception or maybe oversimplification we might make is that in the Old Covenant, God struck people down, and so he was full of wrath. But in the New Covenant, God forgives people, so now he's full of mercy. Well, there's obviously some truth to both of those, but the fact is they were both true of God in both covenants. God has always been a God of wrath, and he has always been a God of mercy. And maybe we know more about that mercy now and how it came to us through Jesus Christ. But the Old Testament certainly speaks of God as a God of mercy. Psalm 32, 1 through 6 says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. David says he found forgiveness for the guilt of his sin. The Lord did not impute iniquity to him. Um, God has always been a God who was willing to forgive people who made mistakes. Psalm 103.8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, 
slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. Now, on the other hand, you might say, well, he struck down people. He struck people dead when they disobeyed him in the Old Testament. But it seems like he did the same thing a few times in the New Testament as well. Um, you might think of Ananias and Sapphira, for instance. A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back some of the price of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Uh, and then you have the same thing happening to Sapphira. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. And Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last and the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Uh, some have, have drawn the parallel. You think about it in the Old Testament, uh, the story of Nadab and Abihu, and they uh, were some of the first priests to ever bring this sacrifice to God in this new covenant. And immediately, almost at the very start of, the, of this new um, this new covenant they were struck down because they they did it wrong and some have pointed out that in the same way this is the very beginning of the new church the early church under the new covenant and Ananias and Sapphira um, are, are struck down by God or they fall dead because of this thing that they have done against God and it's almost as if God is giving us uh, an example or a reminder at the start of this new covenant to realize that He's serious about being treated in, in a way that's holy. Because there are certainly examples in the Old and in the New Testament of people who were disrespectful to God and were not struck down. Um, but those are two examples where at the beginning of a new covenant, people were struck down who had not, had not been respectful to him. Another example would be Acts 12, 21 through 23. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. This is an event just like Ananias and Sapphira that happened after Jesus had come to earth, had walked on the earth, had died, had been raised again after the church had been started. It's the God of the New Testament. And he's a God that still should be feared. Now we do have a sense from Jesus' life as he walked on the earth that he came here um, not primarily to show us God's wrath, but in his time, in his physical form here, to show us God's love and his mercy. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he, as Jesus, turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. So here Jesus had an opportunity to call down fire on these people who were disrespecting him, um, to make an example of them that we ought to honor God. And he didn't do so, and he said he, he didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And I think many will look at the life of Jesus on the earth, and they'll say, this is, this is the total picture of who the God of the New Testament is. He's someone who is always kind and has endless patience and who would never strike anyone down or punish them. He just wants to help people. Um, but that's not all we know about Jesus. We know about how he was as he walked on this earth. But 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10 says, After all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven, 
with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Christ, uh, of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. It appears that Jesus came to walk on this earth to make an invitation to us lovingly and in a gentle way to invite us to come to God. But that's one small piece of this big picture. And in the grand scheme of things, when we look at eternity, we see Jesus coming back in flaming fire, dealing out retribution. He's not just a God who uh, would never punish anyone for anything. Revelation 19 describes him this way. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this God of the New Testament, which is the same as the God of the Old Testament, is a God who has fierce wrath. And his son Jesus Christ is going to tread the winepress of that wrath and strike down nations with a sword and, and beat them with a rod of iron. I think Romans 2, 4 through 8 takes this whole picture of Jesus being meek and mild and kind and inviting and the picture of a God who is wrathful and Jesus who comes to deliver that wrath and packages it all in a way that makes sense and that, that uh, should make us think. Romans 2, 4 through 8 says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Those are the kinds of things that people typically associate with Jesus' walk on the earth. Um, we think of him being kind and tolerant and patient, being gentle with people. He says, do you think lightly of these things, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. It even uses the word storing up wrath because people will often ask, why isn't God doing anything about this situation in which this person is doing something wrong? Why, why won't God stop this? I think one answer is that he is storing up wrath, that sins will not go unpunished forever. And we may say, well, he's just so kind and tolerant and patient. He's, he's not going to do anything. We can do whatever we want, and God, God won't really care about it. But the truth is he's storing up wrath. The God of the Mosaic Covenant was slow to anger, but when his wrath was stored up, he poured it out. The God of the Covenant of Christ is rich in mercy, but he is storing up wrath against those who reject him. And the, the third oversimplification I wanted to look at was that in the Old Covenant, they had animal sacrifices, which meant that they had to follow a religion, and religion is purely ceremonial. It's just kind of like this act that you just have to do um, so that you can check the box. And that's the way it was in the Old Covenant. And then now that we're in the New Covenant, Jesus was our ultimate sacrifice, and we give our bodies as living sacrifices. Um, and so as opposed to religion, now we have a spirituality, and that's really a matter of the heart. And so those outward ceremonial things don't matter. We don't have to do them, and they're not important. And uh, you'll notice in all three of these, these oversimplifications that there's obviously some truth to them. There are a lot of good points that we could draw out of them. 
but sometimes they become an oversimplification. You will notice in the Old Testament uh, that there are a lot of passages that emphasize the fact that animal sacrifice is not like some, some magic wand that just makes everything better. Um, that what God really wanted all along was for people's hearts to turn to him. 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23 says, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. It wasn't like in the Old Testament that well, they could just sin however they wanted because, well, then they were just going to make an animal sacrifice and that would just make it all better again. God always wanted their heart to be turned towards him, to be obedient towards him. In Micah 6, 6 through 8, we read, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Well, according to kind of a traditional understanding of the Old Testament, the answer would be yes, of course. The Lord takes delight in thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil. It's this huge sacrifice. That's exactly what he wants. And Micah says, Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? What God wanted more than anything, more than burnt offerings and yearling calves and rams and rivers of oil, was for people to love God and follow him and walk with him. Hosea 6, 6 says, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Psalm 51, 16 and 17 says, For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Psalm 40, 6 through 8 says, Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burn offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. That's a lot of passages, and I don't think it's an extensive, uh, a comprehensive list of all the passages where in the Old Testament, God sort of emphasizes it's not really about the animals. It's not like God needs, you know, he's hungry and he needs to have the animals for food or something like that. It's about a matter of the heart. But I would ask you to consider in the Old Testament, even when looking at all these passages, would it have been okay if the Israelites had said, well, what really matters is the heart, so we don't have to do those animal sacrifices. You know, God probably doesn't really care if we do it or not. No, that was something he commanded them to do, and so he expected them to follow it from their heart. He wanted both the ceremony and that heartfelt nature behind it. Well, in the New Testament, there are things that would properly be called religion that have been instituted by God. Uh, when we speak of religion, typically we're talking about outward things that you can see. And there are plenty of things that we do that are religious. Uh, when we pray together, when we sing together, um, when we take the Lord's Supper, that's one thing that Jesus instituted. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Here is a physical act, breaking bread and sharing fruit of the vine. Do this physical thing. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And notice he doesn't say, uh, do, this as, uh, do this as a ceremony and just as long as you do it and check the box off, you're good. He says, do it in remembrance of me. Do it because every time you do it, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the same thing was true in the Old Testament. Sort of the parallel to the Old Testament would be the Passover. Well, when the Passover was instituted by God, he said, this is for a reminder. 
so that you can remember what the Lord did for you in Israel. There's a, there's a spiritual and a heartfelt component, not just an outward ritualistic act. So the God of the Mosaic Covenant instituted various religious activities, but he did so for the sake of spiritual growth. And the God of the Covenant of Christ has instituted various religious activities, and he has done so for the sake of our spiritual growth. And it's not appropriate to, to reject them, to say, well, what, what really matters is just my heart. So, you know, I don't need to go to church with other people. Uh, I don't need to be baptized. You know, I don't need to take the Lord's Supper every week because what really matters is my heart. These things were instituted for us, and we must do them, and they're for our spiritual growth. There's a summary of those three ideas. Under the covenant of Christ, there are rules about how we should live. And there is also grace for the times when we fall. And it's easy in each of these cases to try to oversimplify things by ignoring one or the other of these truths. So we could say, well, there's certainly grace for us. Uh, and since we live under grace, there's no real rules about how we ought to live. We just, you know, we worship how we want. We'll live how we want. God wants us to be happy, and he'll have grace towards us. Um, on the other hand, we could ignore the fact that there's grace for us and focus so much on the rules that we never feel good enough, and we're always worried that we won't be saved, um, even though we're actually striving to follow God, and we live in constant fear. If you look at the next uh, set of uh, information, there is wrath being stored up against sinners, but there is mercy for those who are in Christ. Hopefully all of us are, are very aware of the fact that there is mercy for those of us who are in Christ. Um, but we must also know that wrath is being stored up against those who are not in Christ, and that should give an urgency to us. Lastly, there are religious rituals that we must observe. God didn't tell us to do these outward things um, like the Lord's Supper or, or baptism or meeting together or many other things, anything that could be outwardly observable. He didn't tell us, do those things if you feel like it. Um, you know, do, do those things how you want, when you want, if you want. There's these, these things that we must do. Maybe ritual is a word that has a bad connotation, um, but they're physical acts that are done. And they are for our spiritual growth. It wouldn't be appropriate either to do those things and to say uh, it doesn't matter where our heart is. It doesn't matter whether we're doing them in faith or not. Just so long as we do them, that's all that matters. Like we're just checking off boxes. They're meant to be done in full faith and love towards God. So that's a lot to think about. Um, it seems like if we could just not complicate that which ought to be simple and not oversimplify that which is actually a little bit complicated um, then we would know what God's will is for us I hope that's something we can all strive to do and, and just read the scriptures as individuals and understand how the covenants fit together and how the God behind them fits together uh, and I would definitely recommend reading the book of Hebrews if you want to think more about the covenants and about the similarities and the differences between them if anyone this morning wants to respond to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, to do this, this outward thing that you can observe of being baptized, but to do so in full faith and expecting a spiritual work to be done in you by God, or if we can help you in any way, you can come as we stand and sing together.
Savior, all to Thee. O suffering Savior, all to Thee.